afternoon or I guess evening. It's dark out now, isn't it, um, everyone? I'm Jen Gray, Artistic Director of Forward, and thank you for joining us for this um, special lecture in advance of this evening's performance of the amateurs. Um, I'm really excited to introduce our speaker this evening, um, Martin Foyce, who's a professor of medieval English literature at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Prior to his time here in Madison, he was an academic at King's College in London. Um, and it's going to be talking with you about the traditions of medieval theater. And for those who are just arriving, we have a few copies of some handouts, because there's uh, some, some visual images that are very helpful. However, there's also QR codes. So if you are uh, adept with those, you can go ahead and scan that QR co code on your phone. You'll be able to pull up some high def images to uh, follow along with the talk. Um, so without further ado, uh, please join me in welcoming Martin Boyce. Thank you so much, Jen. Uh, I do recommend if you can, you know, point your cam phone, camera's phone at the, uh, at the QR code and you can look, follow along in, in living color or medieval color, I guess. Let's um, so get my talk up. And let me get my timer started since I, I do have a tendency to talk long. So, you know, I'll make sure that doesn't happen by having the stopwatch keep me honest here. All right, here we go. Uh, as Jen mentioned, I'm a professor of English literature. I specialize in old English literature. That's pre-conquest, pre-Norman conquest. Uh, but I teach the whole run of, uh, of medieval literature a lot. And so uh, I'm not particularly an expert in medieval theater. But I do teach a lot about medieval drama, and there's a kind of subtle distinction there in the sense of drama is the literary study of that versus theater is the practice of it. However, they are, uh, you know, uh, very interconnected, and so we'll um, kind of hear, be hearing a lot about the kind of performative space of theater as we go today. My whole job today is to kind of give you a really quick framework for the aspects of medieval theater you're going to see in the amateurs tonight. Uh, the show's a lot of fun, I hope you enjoy it. Uh, you know, it plays a little fast and loose, as one might expect with the kind of traditions. It's kind of a collapse of a bunch of stuff together. So I'm gonna give you a whole bunch of historical reference points. So then when you see these moments in the play, in the play, you'll be like, ah, now I see how this is working, right? So the first thing we need to kind of understand about classical or medieval literature, medieval drama, is that it doesn't really come out of the classical tradition. You know, we have a really strong sense of classical drama, Greek drama, Roman drama, comedies and tragedies. None of that kind of translates into the medieval drama tradition, which is a really kind of a homegrown vernacular tradition that arises out of popular culture, right? Um, so it's not an inheritance of this previous period. And that's kind of what I love about it. You know, it's its own thing. Uh, and so uh, where does it come from? It arises uh, like so many things do in the medieval period, it arises out of the church, right? What you have going on in the Christian Catholic Church uh, is this increasing desire to make the material of the church more accessible, but they're not taking it out of Latin, they're not translating it into vernacular languages, native languages, so what they're doing is they begin to make it more and more performative. And if you are Catholic, like I was growing up, you'll remember what like Easter Mass is like with the kind of really high pageant and the kind of really performative aspects of the priest playing Christ as he comes into the church, you know, on Palm Sunday, or the kind of dramatic uh, reading of the uh, crucifixion scriptures at this time. That's kind of what's going on in about the 10th and 11th centuries in medieval Europe in the churches. It gets more and more performative. And what's interesting about this is there's this one particular moment in the liturgy. It's called the quem quertus moment. And uh, it's Latin for who do you seek, whom do you seek. And it's the moment where uh, the apostles uh, and the women come to Christ's tomb and the stone has been rolled away and everyone's like, oh my goodness, or literally, oh my God, what has happened? And, uh, you know, and then an angel appears and is like, who, you know, who, is, who do you seek? And, it's, and they say, we, we see Jesus. And they're like, he's gone. Um, so that particular episode became really more and more played up until it became basically a play within the church uh, uh, liturgy of, of the, um, of, of the uh, Easter Sunday uh, uh, liturgy and mass. And at some point, 
the church got really uncomfortable with all this popularization and they kind of ratcheted it down and they they list they they came out with a set of canons a set of laws that basically were like you can't have it be this kind of you know speculative specular kind of performative thing and the amazing and that happens around 1200 and what happens then is that impulse for producing faith in terms of performance moves outside the church and it kind of becomes the uh, provenance of communities, of local communities, right? And so what you basically get at this point is the rise of a, a couple of different, three different actual uh, literary traditions here, uh, of theatrical traditions. You have the miracle play, right? The miracle play, which kind of comes out of this moment of Quinquertus, which is a miracle, you know, where is Christ, he is risen kind of thing. So the, uh, the miracle play basically is a single performative uh, uh, event that kind of reenacts any number of scriptural miracles, right? So you you know you might have something like the conversion of Saul to Paul on the road to Damascus, and that's that's a performance, right? Or you might have uh, you know Quemquertus, or you might have uh, even kind of moments that you're going to see later in what we call the cycle plays, uh, Noah's Ark or, or the Nativity play. There you know things where miracles occur. So. The second thing, though, that kind of comes out that really is what medieval drama is known for in a big way is the cycle play, right? And now we're getting into our images here, if you begin to look at uh, the, the, first, uh, the, uh, the first set of images here. The cycle plays kind of begin to come about, at least in England, uh, around the 13th century, late 13th century, early 14th. And they're kind of, they're kind of amazing because they're essentially the longest running show in the history of the world because they essentially begun, begin sometime around 1300 and they're not closed down until the 1540s or so, right? And they literally happen every single year on the Feast of Corpus Christi, which is sometime in the middle of June, right? And so think about it, it's like 200, you know, two and a half centuries of this show happening every year, right? So that's kind of the first thing. The second thing is, is they um, they happen as I noted on the Feast of Corpus Christi, uh, which is the second Thursday after Whitsun, which is the Feast of the Pentecost, which is the ninth, the seventh Sunday after Easter, which basically puts it in, which basically puts it in uh, in the middle of June. And why is this important? I never started my stopwatch. Hang on. <laughs> All right. Eight I'm eight minutes in. Okay, I got it. So eight, that's math. Uh, 27. 17. Okay, got it. When it says 20, no, when it says 17, I'm, I'm too far. Okay. Uh, Cor Cor feast of Corpus Christi, right? Like kind of the feast that the saints, this, the holy feast day that celebrates Christ's uh, um, kind of the, the miracle of the Eucharist, uh, it's a transubstantiation of body and blood, those, these sorts of things. Um, but it happens on the Feast of Corpus Christi because it's one of the longest days of the year, right? And you're thinking about this, you're in Northern England. You've got maybe 16, 17, 18 even hours of daylight, depending on where you are, right? And so it's kind of no surprise that it happens at this at this point. Also, uh, what, is the, what is the cycle play? It's an all day event. In fact, it's usually multiple day uh, events, though it's designed to be an all day event. And it's basically the greatest hits of the Bible performed soup to nuts, you know, starting with the creation, creation of the world and ending with the last judgment. If you scroll a little further ahead down to your third page of images, you'll see a whole list of the guilds of York and the plays that they perform. And you get a really strong sense of, of exactly how many there are, right? It's, you know, sometimes somewhere in the, on the level 50 plays get done. Right? Beginning again, you see the creation and then the fall of Lucifer, ending with Judgment Day and everything in between. So it's the greatest hits of the Bible, right? Sprinkling of Old Testament, sprinkling of New Testament, basically hitting the highlights. So what you kind of have to think about, oh, and the other thing I should point out is, so these are all performed on wagons. You're going to see this kind of an action in the play. They're all performed on moving wagons. They don't move while they're performing. They move it to a certain point. They set up, they perform. But what is cool about this is they finish their performance, which usually takes you know, 15, 20 minutes, 10 minutes sometimes, and then they move on to the next station. So they cycle around the, uh, the, the community. And so again, if you scroll forward to that third page, you're gonna see a map of York, uh, and you see all the different stops along the way where they 
perform. And this is kind of amazing, because first of all, it gives it the obvious reason of why it's called the cycle play, right? Because they're literally cycling through the, uh, the town on wheeled uh, vehicles, right? But um, it's secondly called the cycle play because it is cycling through the scripture. It is cycling through the Bible. It's cycling through all these big hits. But it's a cycle play for a third reason, because it's essentially the cycle of the natural day, the natural cycle, beginning with sunrise and ending with darkness. And if you think about how they can peg that then to the performances, think about the very first performance at the very first station of creation happening with God basically starting with ego sum alpha and omega, I am, you know, I am the beginning and the end. And, uh, and the sun kind of breaking over the sky as, as he begins. And then it ends with darkness and it happens, the last judgment is happening by torchlight. You know, so you get a real strong sense of the beginning and ends of things as these go. Um, so the fact that they happen on wagons is pretty cool. Um, you can look at it several, I've got several images here for you to take a look at uh, in the first couple pages. Uh, the first one is a picture of a 16th century German pageant wagon. It's one of the actual few surviving images we have from the medieval period that depicts something, what these wagons would have looked like. And it's kind of cool for us because it's a ship, right? Because you're going to be hearing a lot about Noah and uh, the flood in the, in, in, in the play today. Um, but uh, it kind of gives you a sense of this. But I also want you to just take a close look at that image and look at, if you can see it, look at, there's so many things going on there in it, right? You've got these... You know, uh, even though we don't know whatever story is happening here, it seems to be a lot of fun. It seems to be kind of festive, right? There's these, you know, devils and horns, and there's these magisters, these some kind of scholars holding up potion bottles. There's people playing horns and flutes, and and you know, it it just seems kind of like vaguely party esque here. And that's one of the big things I always want to stress about what medieval drama was, and it's that it is to use the Latin term, it's ludic, L-U-D-I-C. We get our word ludicrous from it, right? The ludic. Ludic means playful. We literally get the idea of the play, calling these things the play from this idea, right? That there's play going on here. That it's not all just high, serious, sententious, uh, dogmatic theology that, you're, that, that, that is being performed. It has to be entertaining. So there has to be a kind of play between the serious, and the game, if you will. And in fact, the Middle English uh, theater uh, performances were also were often called gamma, the, old, the Middle English word for game, right? And so we can kind of think about that. And play also means flexibility, right? You can play out a line, right? There's a lot of kind of space you can kind of produce when you do this. And so there's a lot of play within the play, if you if you if you take my meaning here. Oh, hang on, my notes turned off because I went I went. I went off book. Um, all right, so uh, so that's the kind of cycle play. But here's the thing about this. I want you to think about this. So you have what, like 50 wagons, all kind of cycling through the town at the same time. What the one begins at the first station, moves to the second, and then the second one moves. And so what you have at the high point of the kind of feast day in the middle of the day are like 50 performances happening. And it kind of collapses this whole notion of a linear cycle. Instead, you have all these different performances kind of happening at the same time. And I did this. I went to like uh, York in 2003 or two or four. I can't remember when they when they first re-performed the York Cycle Plays in the kind of town of York for the first time in like 400 years. It was it was great, and they had all these kind of community organizations with wagons, and you could just run around town. You're like you're looking at your map. You're like, oh wait, if I cut across town here, I can catch the Punch's pilot. And then I can run over here and still catch Abraham and Isaac, you know, and it kind of like just collapses all that divine time into kind of one moment that you are surrounded with. Right. And so it's, it's really immersive as well. So uh, these things aren't these, this main uh, kind of uh, genre wasn't simply called the cycle play. They were also called the mysteries, which is another way it's known by. And there's, again, a number of reasons for this. The mysteries, of course, of scripture, of the divine truth, of the holy narrative, all of these sorts of things. But they're also called the mysteries because if you, again, look uh, over at the uh, list of guilds here, um, they, each of these shows were performed by a specific guild, a set of, of artisans, the kind of community of artisans of that 
of that town or city, right? And they were always kind of thematically related, right? So if you look at like things like, well, you're gonna think about Noah uh, today a lot, right? So there's actually a double play uh, here for Noah. There's the building of the ark and that was the shipwrights guild, right? And then you have Noah and his wife and that was the fishers and the mariners. So there's, it's, they kind of became advertisements for their, these sorts of commercial endeavors, right? The tradesmen be like, hey, you know, so you can, you know that the flood was gonna have a really nice looking ship on top of that wagon because the shipwrights built it, right? Um, and there's, there's ones that, that I always am a bit like, whoa, really? So, you know, the crucifixion is done by the pinners and painters. Pinners are the, the makers of nails. Right, so you know, yeah, it's like it's really. And I guess all PR is good PR. All publicity is good publicity, but you know. Um, so, to go back to these wagons really quickly uh, on the on the second third pages, the shot on the second on the first page shows you a shot of the crucifixion from the York Cycle Play of either 2012 or 2016, um, where it's being done on the grounds of St Mary's Abbey, 13th century Abbey. So very beautiful, and you've got to see how stark and bare that kind of wagon is and it's to kind of show the kind of stripping away all the frivolity at this moment of high drama where Christ is being crucified but then you can go to the next page and you can see Noah's Ark and there's it happening in town and it, it seems to be you know a lot more kind of uh, uh, festive a bit you get this rainbow at the end of uh, Noah's Ark I'll, I'll unpack that stuff very quick uh, very quickly in a couple minutes for you about kind of what's going on in in, in Noah's Ark. But I really want to call attention to that third image on that page. The you got the two Noah's Ark, and then you have this one where you've got kind of three angels, one or three holy figures, one is super high up there. Uh, I think that's the, um, I think that's either Pentecost or the, or the, um, or the Annunciation, I'm not sure. I think it's the Pentecost though, because it looks like you got a lot of befuddled disciples standing down there below them. Uh, but I just want you to note the kind of vertical height that they got on these things. These wagons were incredible pieces of stagecraft and set design, you know? And I think these modern productions are really kind of, you you, you exploit the notion of the wagon and the, what you can build off of it to its ultimate extreme. There were, there were absolutely kinds of special effects and fireworks and flash pans and all sorts of fun stuff happening as well. And you're gonna see in the show a kind of uh, discussion of like what you can do to kind of, in terms of special effects in, in the Middle Ages. All right, so um, the other thing to know about the mystery place, the cycle place that kind of ties into something that's going on today is, um, they were intensely what I call corporate. When I mean corporate, I don't mean they were business-like. I mean, they were a product of a unified community. These were not performed mostly by professional acting troops or touring acting troops. You're gonna, the kind of show today is kind of framed around a touring acting troupe, which is a little anachronistic, but not outside the realm of possibility. Uh, these cycle plays were performed by the townspeople themselves. And so there would have been all kinds of in jokes and lots of kinds of, you know, look at look at Joe, he's, you know, he's playing Noah, isn't that funny? Remember when he fell in the water? Um, you know, that kind of stuff. So there's all kinds of in jokes that would have kind of been playing, but it was also the notion of an entire community coming together to celebrate monolithically a kind of uh, other faith, right? And so there was gonna be a lot of celebration and joy, but also a lot of, again, play and kind of making fun of those things. And there was definitely, the ability to kind of bend the lines of what you were allowed to do in terms of worship and faith in these moments. It was a bit of kind of the carnival, if if you will. And so um, you had this also, this kind of then therefore, because of the townspeople and all of these things, people performing like this, you had the kind of conflation of the then and the now, anachronistic stuff. In the Noah, the Chester Noah play, uh, Noah's wife actually yells at Noah because she's kind of portrayed as a shrew. Uh, she yells at Noah, I'm not getting on your boat. I don't care about your boat. And I don't care about all your French fashion either. You know, which is not obviously something that Noah would have, Noah's wife would have been saying in the, uh, you know, book of Genesis. But it certainly is something you could be saying in the 14th century as an English person, right? Kind of, uh, kind of taking out the, taking out the French. So, um, so in the Noah, Chester's Noah, uh, uh, in the Noah play, there's a couple of things I wanted to note. You're, a lot's going to be made of Noah's wife in this in this uh, play you'll see tonight, and the idea that she doesn't want to get on the boat, and that's actually in these medieval uh, uh, dramas. It's not in the scripture, and a lot of, of kind of talk is done has been 
scholarship has been done about, well, how does this come about? This, this apocryphal tradition of Noah's wife being a shrew. And it can kind of open up from uh, the kind of misogynistic tradition of, of the Catholic faith, you know, beginning with Eve being the one who is causing all the trouble. And But there's also a kind of thematic point to all this. They, Noah's wife doesn't want to get on the boat. She actually wants to stay with her gossips, her friends, her community, who are going to be drowned and left behind. And there's and the, her and the her and no, her her sons have to physically manhandle her onto the boat, and then she kind of watches her her community drowned. And but then there's all that kind of disruption, and then there's the kind of miracle of their survival and the miracle of the dove, and then God appears and produces this giant rainbow and says, "I'm never going to do this again," you know. Uh, and they all sing at the end, and if they sing, they're going to sing in this kind of harmony. And so that whole idea of disruption is contained by the end of the play, you know, so it's a very kind of overweening kind of theological hammer at this point, right? You all have to pull together to be saved and get the rainbow at the end. Okay, so that's kind of the cycle play. Um, there's another kind of play that is really referenced in this, another kind of genre. It's really referenced. In fact, all three genres are referenced. There's the miracle play. You're going to kind of see a couple moments where it's like, oh, that's the kind of thing that would happen in a miracle play. There's certainly this idea of the cycle play and the wagon and all these sorts of things. And then there's the morality play. And the morality play is like the latest kind of version of medieval drama that we have. Uh, and actually, I want you to think about this when you encounter the seven deadly sins happening uh, uh, in, in, in the play that you see tonight, right? This is kind of a kind of classic a structure from the morality plays. The morality plays, uh, unlike the cycle play, but like the miracle play, they're a fixed location. Like you would set up a scaffold, right? A stage, and then there might be a series of stations around it, and you would kind of, but they're all fixed and you would perform that. But secondly, uh, they would be not, they would, might be anchored to specific feast days, but they might just kind of show up. This is the chance where you begin to get the possibility of maybe there were touring companies, professional companies in the 14th, 15th, 16th century showing up and just sort of setting up and playing. Certainly you can draw a line of genealogy from that to the patronage that begins to happen in the early modern period, Shakespeare being part of the, like the kind of uh, Lord Admiral's men and these sorts of things, that kind of noble patronage that uh, are, are, are beginning uh, you begin to see in the early modern period. Um, the big thing about the morality plays is that they're allegorical. So you have these symbolic structures instead of like actual people, personified uh, figures. So uh, you might get, uh, there's a play called Every Man. It's all about just the person dying, uh, like anybody dying. And you start off and you've got your, all your buddies, you've got strength and wisdom and, and, uh, and uh, friendship and goods. And one by one, they leave you. And all you have left is faith. You know, again, can't be kind of hit over the head too hard with that, right? Um, and, I, and the focus of those is the state and maintenance of the Christian person in medieval, in medieval Europe, right? What are you doing in your life today that is like that you need to be doing in order to be saved? And there's, so, so much of the morality plays are about the moral of the story. Uh, and I'll just close because uh, we got I got like two minutes. Um, I'll just sort of close by thinking about one other way to think about this idea of the ludic. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't kind of point this out, but there's these pictures on page four that kind of show a, uh, uh, a, one of the only surviving plans of a morality play. It's called the Castle of Perseverance. We actually have the play as well, but it shows the castle in the, in the middle and then all those stages around. And then you have a nice shot of an engraving of what like a kind of scaffold would have looked like in a town square. But I want to call your attention to that last picture that's at the bottom. Uh, of that page, um, where you just have a kind of performance going on and you have a whole mass of people watching it outside the ruins of an abbey. And there's a real kind of collapse of the idea of performer and audience in these shows. There's no mystic gulf. There's no bright lights on me, you sitting in the darkness. There's no fourth wall that can't be broken. You know, there was constant kind of circulation, again, back to the cycle plays of audience and performer kind of identifying with each other, being a part of each other, and the way in which they would sometimes get the audience to kind of sing songs and sing along with them. Sometimes they would get them to sing really dirty, scatological songs, and then they would basically be like, see how sinful you are? You thought that was fun, but look at how sinful that is, right? And so you kind of want to think about, again, that looting, that play that is, that is happening. And I will just sort of end by saying that 
you can look forward from this stuff to what then emerges in early modern theater, right? The kind of idea of morality plays that, that have their legacy in Christopher Marlowe's uh, Dr. Faust is one of the first big early modern plays. Uh, or, but then also thinking in terms of the actual ideas of stages. Your last page here shows you the cutaway shot of like what a, 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 co a coaching in would have looked like in the 1540s and 1560s. Here's the thing. The cycle plays, the morality plays that are touring around, they end in the Reformation, 1530s and 1540s, but they kind of keep going on in the countryside for a little longer. And it's very much thought that Shakespeare would have seen some of the last kinds of performances of these. And these coaching inns would have been the places in which they would have set up. And so if you look at the way these coaching inns are, uh, look like, you sort of begin to see the evocation of what, say, the Globe Theater and the Rose Theater, these early modern Renaissance shows that uh, theaters that were built for Shakespeare's plays and the, and the time there. And I, the last picture there is of the George Inn in Southwark, um, really close to um, uh, actually where uh, Chaucer sets his the beginning of the Canterbury Tales at the Tavern Inn. But that's one of the last remaining sides of the of a coaching inn, so you can get a, get a real sense of how you would have had these tiers of audiences. It would have been kind of watching and then you would have had the people on the ground that would have been watching and it's like not too far to get from that la from that last moment of medieval theater to that first moment of early modern theater that gets us you know moving towards what modern theater is today and that's my talk thank you i think we have two or three minutes for questions and I can't see anything, so you have to yell. Anyone have any questions for Professor Coyne? Well, the uh, plays we out on, on the streets, what were the church people like? I mean, were the priests out there holding them? I mean, I think there's, you, you would have had a kind of, there was a vexed relationship with it, right? Because you have in the 13th century this kind of trying to lock it down, and there's this constant tussle between the sacred and the profane. But these also are performances that are really pretty much, you know, they are not gainsaying scripture. They're promoting scripture. They're performing scripture. And so, you know, I think you eventually would have had an accommodation of it. Uh, in a play like Everyman, for instance, uh, this famous morality play, there's a moment towards the end where you have this weird kind of narrative digression uh, which you can kind of think about today, um, Act Two. Um, uh, this weird narrative digression uh, where uh, a magister, a teacher, and a cleric, as a priest, come out and they have this big debate about who, what's more important, a teacher or a priest, you know? And so, like, and the priest, of course, is like, you know, clearly it's more important. And then the, then the priest kind of leads them, uh, or in another play, uh, Croxton play of the sacrament, the priest then leads everybody kind of in a procession. So I think absolutely the church would have been like, is it our exactly our cup of tea? No. Is it something that is doing God's work? Probably yes, enough, more good than bad. And it's it's the notion of the carnival. You've got to have that kind of release, that steam release, that you know, if, if you think of society as a pressure cooker and there's no way to get rid of, you know, let off some steam, eventually the top blows off. So the church, you know, is pretty heavy-handed, oppressive uh, represent institutional structure in the Middle Ages. Um, so, you know, I think they kind of understood that this stuff was necessary. That's a really great question. Yes, um, we have surviving four cycle plays um, uh, in various forms of completion. We have the York cycle play, uh, the Waverly cycle play, I'm sorry, the Wakefield cycle play, um, the Chester cycle play, and then this is the best one. It's called the End Town because you wrote your name of your town in it, right? <laughs> like, so End Town. Um, and that one only survives. There's only a couple ones that survive from that one. But, um, but yeah, so like, yeah, the, like, and we actually have also kind of records, say in like York, of like how much it costs to, for a certain guild from the guild hall records to, you know, in, you know, 1384, they needed six pounds for finery for this wagon kind of stuff. So they had scripts, you know, they were literary constructions and some of them were masterful. Uh, there's several of the York plays are written by someone we call the York Master, who was writing in this kind of high alliterative poetry. 
you know, it is, you know, you can put it up against any, any of the best surviving medieval English poetry of the period, you know, but he didn't write all of them. And so you can tell when the York masters at work and then somebody else is at work, but they also would have been living documents that would have changed year to year in accommodation of performers, you know, contextual things happening in the town, all sorts of stuff. Yeah. Can you say a little more about what led to the decline and demise of this type of play, perhaps? Henry VIII. Yeah. Henry VIII is what led to the, the collapse and decline of this. It was the Reformation. I mean, basically, every it was uh, these sorts of plays were papist. They were they were Catholic. They were absolutely they were banned. They were not to happen. In the same way that you had the monasteries being dissolved and all those amazing medieval manuscripts that are you know the bread and butter of my work being destroyed, um, you had you know the shutting down of the theaters. You know, and then you can think about how it rises up again, and then you have the Puritans in the sixth in the you know first century, first decades of the 1600s, shutting them down again. You know, so. Uh, always this kind of like the desire for this kind of play and performance of cultural of, of culture and then the kind of repressive structures that shut them down. Mm. You can do one or two more. Sure. Um, Hi. Um, were there any distinguishing like characteristics or costumes or certain characters that would make them? Yeah, we have like little tiny uh, clues about this stuff, right? So um, for instance in Chaucer's The Miller's Tale. Oh, I'm so sorry. Um, were there any kinds of distinguishing uh, costumes or characteristics of characters in these plays? Uh, and uh, and we have like all sorts of little clues to that. We again, we have these records, you know. So like, you know, big red cape for Pilot or something, you know. Like, or but but Pilot actually in in Chaucer's The Miller's Tale, I think there's a description of of a character of Absalom, I think, who speaks in as high a voice as Pilot. And that's a great little clue that is like so. Pilots this character punches Pilot in the in the in the medieval drama. Who would have had this really screechy high, maybe effeminate voice, right? So he's kind of being lampooned a bit in these in these in these uh, in these plays. Are we good? I think we're good. All right. Thank you so much.